here's what's coming up on your horizon. So here's a sobering thought. Take any first grade classroom from around the country and of those students, 65% of those first graders will work in a type of job that does not even exist today. Today, our focus is centered around a simple yet complex question, what's next? We'll spend our time talking with noted futurist Lowell Catlett about a future that's not near as bleak as some would have you believe. Stay with us for a look to the future on Oklahoma Horizon. Oklahoma Horizon is made possible by CareerTech, a job for every Oklahoman and a workforce for every company. With additional support from the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food and Forestry. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us here on Horizon. I'm Rob McClendon. Well, for the world of work, the driver of the last 20 years has been digitization. Computer code has changed everything from how we work to what we work on. And while we've seen some jobs go away, others have been created. Today, our focus is on what's next and what that will mean for all our lives. And the person who'll take us on that journey is noted futurist Lowell Catlett with some background. Here's our Blaine Singletary. There's an old proverb that says, no news is good news. But Lowell Catlett says the good the news kind of about our economy is out there. We're a strong 18 plus trillion dollar economy. Okay. Lowell Catlett is the former Dean of Agricultural, Consumer and Environmental Sciences at so New Mexico State University. He's known as a futurist. Can't forecast the future, but I can try to help you prepare for it. So let but me... his message about the economy is all about looking at our present situation from a different perspective. We're still one fourth of the world's economy. So can an $87 trillion economy handle a debt load of roughly the same amount as our GDP, 18 trillion? Well, in the business world, that's a pretty good debt to equity ratio. So. Overall, we're a growing economy. Overall, we've never had more net worth. Never. Never in history. Catlett's message is that, economically, it's never been a better time to be an American. Over the course of the past few decades, we've grown in wealth, and now enjoy common access to things that we never knew we wanted back then. You want uh, maybe private school for your children, where the previous generation went to public school. Maybe you want a bigger house. Maybe you want two houses now. You know, it's driving a whole mechanism of new products. And this growing trend in wealth is happening other places too. He's traveled the world over spreading his message with industry leaders and helping companies plan for this growth and output in his unique, upbeat way. Since 1970, the world produced slightly less than 4 trillion. Now the world produces how much? The largest ever recorded in history. 70 trillion bucks. 70 trillion? The world has gotten wealthier, but come on folks, so have we. Some would argue a disproportionate amount of that wealth is flowing to the 1%, and you'd be right, but Catlett's got some good news for the other 99%. The 1%ers, as we call them, control 19%, or have 19%. The real question is for us other 99%, is that 81% left giving us a good life? Yeah, there's inequality, but the real question is, what does the other 99% have, and they have the best life they've ever had in history. And part of the reason for that is just how much we can do with our disposable income today. So, how much of your disposable income does it take to eat in the United States of America? It's the lowest it's ever been in history, lowest in the world, 9.6%, are you with me? Average American household has 70% of their disposable income after eating, drinking, eating out, owning a home, paid their utilities, hooked to the internet, left to do what? I call it buying crap, okay? 
and looking towards the near future, he says there's a lot more wealth about to change hands. Two-thirds of that nation's wealth of the 87 trillion is held by my generation baby boomers. Okay. Because 40% of it is tied up in properties and real estate values. So you're going to see the largest intergenerational transfer of wealth in the next 10 years that's ever occurred in history. Because we have the largest amount of money to transfer. So with a huge amount of money on the horizon and many aspects of our current situation looking better than they ever have, Catlett's message is what many economists are saying. These times will pass. As industries get shaken up by technology, however, things might look a little different on the other side. Healthcare has just changed. Manufacturing just changed. And now education just changed. Great opportunity for you. Your business? <laughs>
to go into what we would call the trade associations. Mm -hmm. Well, with new augmented reality, we got a way to rapidly get them a skill set that we never had before, mm -hmm. if we can get it done. Mm -hmm. Does our society need to approach work maybe a little bit differently? Because I, I do understand what you're saying about females going into the workplace, but I also understand there's a, a definite leakage of those females once they get into the workplace just because of family concerns. Sure, mm -hmm. sure, sure. It's, it's, we're, we're rapidly approaching um, a situation where we will change the work family dynamic more in the next 20 years than at any time in history. And let me start first with education, if I might, for just a second and come back to it. Thomas Jefferson, when he founded the University of Virginia years ago, in the early 1800s, wouldn't allow degrees to be offered. Because his concept was, if you get a degree, you think you're done. Okay? <laughs> and he wanted people to understand that education is lifelong. But I also call it the Uber effect. Mm -hmm. The Uber, you know, the, the folks that said basically just put, punch, punch the button, we know where you are, and somebody in their private car will take you somewhere for a few bucks. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's a fabulous technology. Okay? Mm -hmm. So you start applying Uber technologies to people that want to raise a family but would like to work 20 hours a week. Mm -hmm. But if at that 20 hours a week they have to commute into a traditional work environment or they're going to be rigidly controlled by a traditional work environment, they may not do it. Mm -hmm. But wait a minute, that, that effect says what you're after from me is the value of my input and my labor. Why do you care how that comes about? How, why do you care where, where it's done or how it's done? So we start linking them in ways that just dr drives traditionalists crazy. You know, it's like, uh, you, 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 you gotta be here. Well, what you're after is the value of my input and labor. You shouldn't be concerned how that comes about. So I may work 15 hours a week. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and the real trend that's out there, and it's we're moving so fast that one futurist, a guy by the name of Ray Kurzweil, calls it singularity. The point that we will get to when artificial intelligence exceeds humans. He says and thinks that it'll be probably within by 2030 or so, another 15 years. Hmm. Well, wait a minute. If that occurs, there's a whole bunch of people says, well, if that's the case, then there's no re their work will be done totally by robots and the humans will not exist. But techno we've, we've moved toward where we went from 70 hours a week to 35 hours a week. And now you have, most people have their weekends. Mm -hmm. If you're not spending 90% of your time to put food on the table, you got a whole bunch of other time to be productive in other ways. Mm -hmm. And so technology's always created more jobs than it's destroyed. And have more leisure time has always created more business opportunities than is taken away. Because if you got your weekends free, you want to go to a football game. You want to go to a soccer match. You want to do some things. Guess what? You're going to buy a Coke. Guess what? You're going to drive a car. It, it creates more jobs. So when we move towards singularity, we, we may move, my point to come back to bring it all to focus is, we, we may move to a world where you spend five hours a week earning your living. Hmm. It's, it's just skewed and totally has the opportunity within certainly, I'm, I'm an old man, I'm 66, but probably within my lifetime we'll get close to it. I don't know if we'll ever reach it where we have it totally, but as we move toward it, just think of what's happened in the last 50 years about we spend virtually nothing trying to get to put food on the table. Mm -hmm. And you get to do all kinds of other things in there. So, it's going to totally push us all to rethink work and family and leisure. Long answer to, mm -hmm. I don't know the answer, but it's going to be totally integrated in a way that we just can't even think about. Yeah. So it sounds like the next big thing is not only technology, but how we relate to that technology. Totally. Totally. It's always been the case. Mm -hmm. It's always been the case. Okay? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and technologies don't necessarily always come without a dark side. None of us is going to give up the automobile. But 32,000 people die on the roads every year. Okay. But that's why we're working toward, guess what? Used to be 56,000 20 years ago. 
More people died on the highways from automobile accidents than died in the whole Vietnam War in a single year. Hmm. So it pushed us to passive restraints, airbags, and the next layer is, guess what? Totally driven car. I mean, boy, mm -hmm. Tulsa wants it. General Motors says it's number one priority. 3,800 miles without a single accident, coast to coast, totally automatically driven General Motors car last year. Certainly can make the commute a little bit different. It will. And you might want to have a beer while you go. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought of that. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's one of those things that it has downside, but because that downside was so severe, guess what? We worked on other technologies to make it less severe. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you're seeing traffic deaths gradually decline mm -hmm. because it was the technology that we're not going to give up mm -hmm. and we'll put up with it simply because it adds so much value. Now in 2015, the giant brokerage firm Charles Schwab took automation a step further with robo-advisors, an online service that will pick stocks for you based on your personal financial goals and your stomach for risk. Now robo-advisors have been tried before, but Schwab made it mainstream with more than $4 billion invested in the firm's intelligent portfolio offering in its first year. Still to come on Oklahoma Horizon, the intersection of technology and healthcare. But first, energy and agriculture. Well, with the price of oil in the doldrums and Oklahoma's workers suffering from it, it may sound a bit Pollyannish to predict a return to boom times. But that's exactly what Lowell Catlett predicts based on the simple laws of supply and demand. If something kind of works in economics, we call it an axiom. If it works more than kind of, we call it a law, and we ain't got many. But one of the laws that we have is there's an inverse relationship between price and quantity. Okay? So guess what? If you got a high price, you can bet generally what? There's not many of them. Okay? It's a pretty good law. Gee, let's see. At $100 a barrel for oil, we found the damn stuff in North Dakota. And then when North Dakota became a big oil producer, guess what? Did we have some more oil than we thought we were going to have? Kind of. What happened to the price of oil? Okay. It's a pretty good law. Okay. To do all the things we talked about requires energy in phenomenal magnitudes. Okay? And it has to be mobile and it has to be usable. And we're going to look at different ways of doing that. It may be that we'll move more toward electric vehicles, but you still have to charge those things. So we may charge them by very efficient solar cells. We may charge them by wind. We may charge them by stripping out petroleum into other component parts and using it to, to create little small fuel cells. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But energy, the demand for it, is going to explode already is. Mm -hmm. okay? It's just going to be in multifacets. Mm -hmm. And as we learn more about each one, we'll do it. And we sometimes discard some. We've discarded a lot of coal plants to try to meet emission standards. But SAC Power in Saskatchewan has a coal-powered plant that basically meets the same stringent requirements we have in the U.S. that can only be met with natural gas. And they're doing it with coal. So they're using technologies in a way that nobody thought possible. So mm -hmm. if you're creative enough, you can do it. On to another one of our, our major industries here in the state, and that is agriculture. With our growing global population, what does that mean for agriculture? We have to double meat production in the next 20 years to meet the demand for the rising wealth because the first thing they want when they get more money around the world is a better diet. The first thing they want in their diet is more meat. We have to double meat production. We're not going to do it anywhere in the world for the most part other than in the U.S. We have the capability, the infrastructure, and the know-how to do it. And, and I say we do it in intensive animal operations because that's where they have the least impact on the environment, the greatest gain in physical care and health, and the greatest feed efficiency. So. What's it mean for agriculture? It means we're going to have to meet that demand for meat because the world wants it and they want U.S. meat. They want it in poultry, they want it in pork, they want it in beef. 
It's no small wonder that the Chinese have purchased and are rapidly moving toward getting as much of the pork facilities as they can in the U.S. Okay? Mm -hmm. Because we've got to supply that meat protein. Okay? If we've got to supply that meat protein in intensive animal operations, we need corn, we need soybeans, we need wheat. We need crops to, to, to do that. So overall, I say it's the greatest time to ever be in agriculture. Because mm -hmm. mm. you've got to do that, and you also got to say, for people that say, well, I, I, I know that, but I, I, want, uh, you know, I want to know that that animal, I want to know who raised that animal, I want it certified all the way down. I want cageless chickens, I want free range. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just, you got a whole segment of marketplaces that guess what? I know for a fact, you got them here in Oklahoma. You got ranchers that will provide you natural beef, no antibiotics, all day long. Mm -hmm. And you got people that are trying to produce as many pounds of beef as they can to feed a different group of people. And you got them side by side. Mm -hmm. We've never had that before. Best time ever to be in agriculture. Now, Dr. Catlett is a Regents Professor in Agricultural Economics and a former Dean at New Mexico State University. And if you're interested in the future of food and agriculture, I have a link to Catlett's keynote address at the 85th National FFA Convention that I think you'll find interesting. To watch that, just head to OKHorizon.com and look for it under our value added section. Horizon is at your fingertips. Join us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube to catch the segments you may have missed and our latest new content as it happens. Well, the world's last economic revolution was brought to us by computer code. But the next revolution, well, it may be one in our genetic code. In the not too distant future, the cost of medicine may be heading down, while the delivery of health care, well, it may be heading up. It's a medical revolution that is being brought to us by technology, from do-it-yourself diagnostics to hospitals at home. The best thing, and I'll pull it out here and show it to you, is this. It's called do-it-yourself diagnostics. Mm -hmm. Your cell phone, okay? Little device on the back, we'll do a blood, count, blood cell count, mm -hmm. give you your INR value every day, give you your, uh, if you're on blood thinners, it will give you uh, your white cell count, red cell count, already here. Hmm. We do it for heart monitoring right now. Put my finger over here, all my heart data with an app. If you're my age, I'm 66, I go to a cardiologist once a year, one data point. How about five a day? How about infinite? So now we have do-it-yourself diagnostics. Totally changes everything, hmm. okay? And more importantly, you take the Uber effect, and here it comes. The patient will see you now. <laughs> Wait a minute, you speak, the doctor will see me now? No, I'm busy. We start linking healthcare in ways we never dreamed possible. There's a, there's a, and it, this is, this is mostly a change in attitude and it's called hospitals at home. And there's several hospitals that will do this. You come and you, you, you need very intense care. We take your hospital, we do the evaluations, we take a hospital bed, ever the monitoring, take it to your home, set it up. The specialist, we have all the information constantly monitored. The specialist, the doctors, everybody comes to your place. Cheaper, better outcomes. Mm -hmm. Hospital beds at home. Wow. Totally revolutionizes healthcare. What's your best advice for the working Joe, for that middle class person going forward into the future? To not be afraid to try something because it'll trigger your thinking about things. I, it took me a long time, and I keep coming back to Uber because I'm just, I just go, if I need a public transportation, I just go stand on the taxi cab line or I'll call a taxi cab. I mm -hmm. thought that was really nice to have a cell phone and call a taxi cab. Mm -hmm. Try a technology because you alone as an individual will figure out, you know what, well, well why couldn't I do that? I, I, I was just shown at Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory, the virtual reality they set up. I have no idea the millions of dollars, the virtual reality, because you gotta go in and change a nuclear reactor rod or fix it. But they wanted to do it with virtual reality and so they simulated it. Mm -hmm. One guy, high school dropout, said, you know what? That's very costly, lots of computers. He just had a different vision about different angles and lenses 
It's now called Oculus, 199 bucks set of glasses that are better than most multi-million dollar virtual realities, okay? Mm -hmm. Try a technology, you'll find out that guess what? You might see an application somewhere, because I guarantee you, if you need a plumber on Saturday night, you might be the one that designs and builds the Uber system for plumbers. Well, Dr. Catlin, as always, my pleasure. My pleasure. Next time on Oklahoma Horizon, we look at the science and art at the new Leonardo da Vinci exhibit at Science Museum, Oklahoma. In Da Vinci the Genius, you're able to look at the work of Leonardo, one of the greatest minds in human history. He was not just the, the amazing painter, he was not just the wonderful engineer, he was a designer, he was a big thinker, and that's why Leonardo is so important. Science and Art on Oklahoma Show for the Heartland, Oklahoma Horizon. Thanks for including us as part of your day. I'm Rob McClendon. Hope to see you back here next week.